Hello, everyone, and welcome back to JD TV. I'm your host today, Josh Deming. I am joined by Alex Gongay Ruzik, and today we are going to preview Canada's upcoming match against Panama. And Alex, I brought you on today because, you know, I love chatting with you. I love chatting with you, especially about the men's national team when it's time. But I also have a task for you right off the bat, and that is to try to explain what this match actually means because it is a friendly on paper. But there's a lot of layers to this. This match actually has a lot of meaning. So Alex, right off the bat, I'm throwing it to you and try to explain it to the viewers what this match truly means. Yeah, uh, well, it's never as as is the case in CONCACAF, as we've learned over the years, there's never anything straightforward. Anyone remember the original 2022 World Cup format with the, you know, the gauntlet that, that teams had to go through and the buy straight to the final round? It's uh, th there's always something going on. And for right now for Canada, um, it's all in the rankings again. It's, it's it's like it's 2019 all over again. In 2020, they got to get ranking points because uh, for the quarterfinals and semifinal seeding of the Nations League, Canada, of course, lucky enough to get a bye due to their uh, to, to their Concacaf rankings. They don't have to do the group stages right now that teams are going through. But uh, to, to earn better seeding, they want to finish as high as possible in the rankings, which is uh, convenient because. Both due to, uh, to to just you know availability, but also due to this reason, Panama, Canada, uh, the U.S., Mexico, who you know all got buys, they're all trying to play each other to improve their Concacaf rankings index. And after the last window, Canada got a huge win over the U.S. and a draw away to Mexico. Currently, the rankings are Mexico in first, then it's Canada in second, then it's the U.S. in third, Panama in fourth. Of course, the big permutations are that, but you know, if Canada is able to somehow push up to first or you know stay in second, they would face the fourth or third best uh, team coming out of Ligue, which is nice because you know, likely based on how things will go, you avoid a Jamaica, you avoid a Costa Rica, which are the two teams you want to avoid, and you know, heading in the quarterfinals, depending on how the rankings shake up. In theory, you could potentially get a better matchup, especially if Panama climbs up into that third spot and Canada stays second. Or if Canada ends up in first, Mexico second, U.S. third, Panama fourth. Then again, you get Panama in the semifinals. Tough matchup, no doubt. But I think you want to avoid the U.S. given that the final four will be in the U.S. Um, so, yeah, it feels like for Canada, they just want to finish as high up in the rankings as possible to have an easier quarterfinal and, of course, a more favorable semifinal. So while this is a friendly, while Canada might not be going full, full out to, 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 to try and win, there is a big value in getting three points, especially if there's some favors around CONCACAF, such as Mexico losing and, and other things of the like. I mean... It's funny for a friendly, Alex, you spent like two minutes there trying to explain everything that was going on, and this is a friendly match. There is a lot on the line. On top of it, just a little icing on the cake, in the live FIFA rankings, Canada right now is 38, Panama's 37, they're, you know, they're playing each other depending what happens. They could leapfrog them, obviously climb up the, the ranking there, but I'm, I'm curious, Alex, just right off the bat, because of everything that is technically on the line here for a friendly, we saw Jesse Marsh bring in a lot of new faces as well. Do you think that we're going to see them? Do you think he mainly brought in some of these dual nationals or in, in young players just to maybe get them experience, you know, bring them to a camp, chat with Jonathan David, chat with Alfonso Davies, and just understand, you know, what it's like to be a part of a Canada camp, but not actually maybe play them in the game because it, despite it being friendly, as you just went through, there is a, lot, a decent amount of meaning on it. Or do you think that at the end of the day, they're just going to roll the dice and say, you know what, I want I brought these players in for a reason, a Santiago Lopez, I want to see what he can do, let's throw him 20 minutes in the Panama game, you know, I don't care what the score is. I really don't know the answer, I, I'd probably lean towards just giving them that experience and playing this game to win because something's on the line. Do you see it a different kind of way though? Uh, yes and no, I think the big factor to consider here is that they had extra training time and as we've known with Canada, Training time is is always tough to come by. You know, even remember Jesse Marsh when he came in, he was kind of lamenting a bit that with how quick things were, right? They went straight into the June window in Europe and then they had to go right into Copa America. They had three days off that were pre-planned. And remember Jesse Marsh was like, man, I wish we didn't have those three days off because I really want to work, guys. This camp is valuable for even the regular guys to just, you know, get more work in, more time to do intense trainings that you can't always do if you have games. Uh, you know, like on the Thursday, on the Friday, they don't play all the way to the Tuesday. So they're able to do some really intense training in Montreal and even in the first portion of their Toronto segment. And that's huge for the regulars. And I think that's huge for the young guys. And I think that's why they brought in the young guys, because this is a great experience of 
all right, we're going to drop you into intense trainings and, you know, we'll see how you respond. We'll see how a Kwasi Poku looks in that environment. We'll see how a Santiago Lopez, a Jamie Knight LaBelle. And I think from there, what we'll see is anyone who earns it, first off, will make the trip to, to, to Toronto. Jesse Marsh mentioned heading into the camp that there's a strong possibility with how big the group is and the fact they only have one game that, okay, maybe after the Montreal portion, you send some guys home to their club so they can get some, some training and get focused on their clubs. Well, I, I think what we'll see with the young guys is based on who's in the lineup on, on, on you know, when they play Panama, those are the guys who will have earned it throughout their playing camp. Because Jesse Marsh has also shown that if you earn it, you'll get a look. I think it was telling that Nathan Saliba last window, you know, he was a last minute call up. Uh, he wasn't, you know, even supposed to be in the group. He comes in, works hard. He gets minutes, right? He gets his debut. And I think that's Jesse Marsh kind of showed that you work hard, you'll get your moment. We've seen it with Tani Oluwesi. We've seen it with with other players. So I think uh, that that extra training time will really be telling for some of these guys if we see them or not. I was about to just use Tani as an example that he was the 25th player brought in to that camp for the Netherlands and France. And all of a sudden, you know, he impressed Jesse Marsh and he's the third striker right now after Kyle Aaron and Jonathan David. So a lot can happen in a pretty short amount of time if you can impress Jesse Marsh. You mentioned that they were training in Montreal. Alex, I want to get your thoughts on just that whole experience because we saw with Mexico and, well, the United States and Canada being the three co-hosts, sometimes when there's other Nations Leagues going on with CONCACAF, with Europe, uh, the Asian qualifiers, AFCON as well, it's hard to find these friendlies. So Mexico got a little creative. They got one friendly in against the United States. But they're playing Valencia in a game that doesn't impact like them at all in terms of you know the CONCACAF rankings or FIFA rankings, but they got an extra match in. Canada, I thought maybe we're going to try to do something kind of similar, you know, maybe take on one of the Canadian MLS teams, uh, but they didn't, but they found a way to engage fans in Montreal. And I saw some awesome pictures of uh, fans attending the open training session. Um, you know, some local clubs had players visit them. Uh, it was really nice to see all, just the love that this team was showing to the community in Montreal so and, and surrounding areas. So what did you make of it? I loved it because, I mean, I think, first off, it's so great that Montreal is kind of the first city that gets this because it feels like they've been so ignored, really. Like, there's no other way to put it. It's yeah. like their last men's national team match was what, like 2017? It was like Alfonso Davies, one of, some of his first games in the, the Canadian shirt. It's been so long since they've been there. And, you know, despite they've been a factory for the national team, all these players that have come through the Kones, you know, the the Johnston when he was there, Miller when he was at Montreal. We've seen Waterman, you know, Saliba, Sirwa, like so many key players have been, you know, going through the ranks at Montreal. It's needed. And I think it's great because Jesse Marsh has, you know, started to make a term or use a term that I think will start to stick on <laughs> after moments like this. It's the people's team, right? He wants this yep. team to be you know, one that is recognizable across the country that people can relate to. And moments like this are massive because we saw it like with the club visits. Kids now, you know, after a generation of national team players that, hey, they weren't just, and it's unfortunate because there's some great guys who played on those teams in the 2010s, but they weren't recognizable. They weren't, you know, people that the general Canadian consciousness would know. And I think that's a bit unfortunate, especially with guys like Atiba Hutchinson, right? Like he was an icon in Turkey. He was, he's, he was, he should have been a Canadian icon, but both due to the national team's level and also just maybe the fact that people weren't paying attention to what was going on in Turkey. He was ignored here, right? Guys like Junior Hoylet, other guys, maybe not as well known. Now everyone knows the national team. You can go to a park and you can talk about Jacob Schaffelberg. People know who Jacob Schaffelberg is after this summer. They know who Moise Bombito is. They know who Derek Cornelius is. And by doing these club visits, you know, kids can get a chance to meet their heroes, guys that they now know, now recognize, and also can help the national team gain a little respect, a little, you know, name variety of, okay, this national team, A, has, you know, charismatic guys that, that are going to put themselves out there and, and, and be involved in the community. It just feels like it's all helping each other. The national team's helping the clubs, the clubs are helping the national teams, and it kind of creates uh, a cycle. So I think this is great. I think I'm excited to see if they can do more opportunities like this, especially for cities 
like in the prairies, in the Maritimes, where they've really been underserved in terms of the men's national team. Because if it is going to be the people's team, it's going to need to be coast to coast. And the reality is outside of Toronto and Vancouver and sometimes Montreal, we haven't seen a whole lot of that coast to coast. So I was going to go there, Alex. Uh, I, I love what, going on my timeline and seeing all the pictures and, and you know, it's like, guys who we and girls who we communicate with just on X going and, you know, meeting the players, getting signatures. Like it was awesome to see. I agree. I'm curious to see if they do something like this again in the near future, where are they going to go off top of my head? Just I, in terms of a, a community that's maybe shown that they're deserving of this. I, I'd look at Halifax. I feel like that would be great to get them in there. I'm also wondering if like, and I don't know this, I, I'm curious to see what you may, you may say, but if the CPL is looking to expand, Saskatchewan's always been rumored. Maybe it's a, a bit of a test market to not, you know, maybe not bring a, a game there. Uh, I don't know if that'd be possible, but it, to do something like that and just see what the reaction is, maybe some other areas as well. Quebec City, if I know you're just in Montreal and they were kind of doing that, but I'm curious to see if they used that area and, and that influence from the players to see if, you know, th- there's a lot of interest here in soccer. So maybe it's time for like a, C- a CPL to dip their toes in there. Do you think I'm I'm going somewhere with that or am I a little off base? You no, know, I think it's important, right? Because coast to coast, it comes in different factors. It comes at the club level of the professional game with the CPL, with now the NSL too, right? Because I imagine they'll be looking at a lot of those markets. You got to find different ways to, to create outreach and the reality is the national team can play a role. You see it in a lot of countries, right? Of the, the one tradition I'll always love is like in France, for example, whenever they go into a major tournament, everyone who makes the team brings their first ever club jersey and they do that team picture, right? Of connect, yeah. you know, remembering where you came from. And I think by this camp, you kind of saw that, right? Like I also think a nice touch is, you know, Moise Bombito comes in a camp. They don't send them to some random place out in Montreal or Jonathan David comes into this camp, Theo Bear comes into this camp. They all went to their clubs. Like Theo Bear went to Ottawa, right? Jonathan David went to Ottawa. Moise Bombido went to Saint Laurent. We saw, you know, some of these guys, Bassong, Sirois, uh, all these guys with local connections go to their local clubs. I think it's really cool to, to, to see that as well because it's, you know, all those little ecosystems, it starts at the amateur level, but then of course the professional level is kind of a gap to bridge between the, those few things, right? Yeah, it, it was beautiful. I love to see it. I want to see more of it. But we do need to talk about the match itself. Alex, we've, we've kind of described what it means. We, we talked about uh, the awesome trip that we saw with our players in, in Montreal and surrounding areas. So let's quickly just touch on the game. It is a friendly. I, I will dive right into the lineup and maybe we can just touch on a few players that we, we want to highlight as we go through it. Uh, but I will just quickly name off a starting 11 and you can we can kind of pick it apart to see which players maybe could start over some others. I think it's relatively, if, if Jesse Marsh is playing, I, I think his preferred starting 11 and playing to win, I think it'll be something along the lines of a 4-4-2. Crepeau will be the starting keeper. Without Alistair Johnson, I'm assuming it's going to be Richie Larea at right back. Then we'll have Bombito, Cornelius are two center backs. Davies at left back. Right mid will be Ahmed. Two center mids will be Schwanier and Eustachio. Left mid is probably one up for debate. Liam Miller's form can maybe... I think deserving of a bit of a start. Plus Schaffelberg has been coming back after uh, having his child. So maybe he's not fully up to fit, although he has been playing a little bit more for Nashville. I'm leaning maybe still towards Schaffelberg getting the start, but I could see it being Liam Miller. And then up front, we got Kyle Lair and Jonathan David. Both players are in excellent form. I don't know the last time we've talked about David and Laren being in this type of form going into a, a Canada camp in a while. Both on 29 goals as well, Alex. So they're tied for the all-time Canadian leading goal scorer. Next one is the first player to ever hit 30 goals for their country and will be the, you know, the the standalone top scorer. So I don't think Tanny or anybody else will break into the starting um, striker duo. So that's my team. Do you think there's a little bit of debate there? You know, am I overlooking a player? Do you think that's uh, maybe what we're going to see? Yeah, I think it's hard to see anything but that, given the nature of the game, at least based on the last window, right? Because Canada kind of targeted... The U.S. game is the like go all out game. And I think this Panama kind of has a similar feel of they're going to want to go all out and they don't have a second game to rotate like they did for Mexico. And that's pretty much the same lineup, right? Other than uh, Johnston, who got injured in that game and then had to step out. That was the game they they, they had uh, or the the lineup they had. Pardon me. So, yeah, I, I honestly see them running it back. I think it's something where names I could see slot in like Sam Atacugby. 
I see him later in the game as a, you know, just a chance to finally see him now that he's fit and giving up or putting in 90s for the white caps. Uh, maybe in the middle, we see Saliba get a bit of a reward for his strong form lately with Montreal. And he comes in uh, later in the game. Then, of course, I think, you know, Schaffelberg starts just because he's been scoring for Canada. But then Miller maybe gets a bit of a longer look based on his form. Maybe, you know, with Laren and David. Uh, now that they're in form, you kind of see what that's like. And then you give, you know, Bear just scored his first Liga and yeah. goal. I think you you give, you know, you probably want to give him uh, some sort of look at, in that regard. So I think there's guys across the pitch that we'll, we'll see. But I think Jesse Marsh is going to kind of want to build familiarity because at the end of the day with November window coming up, he's going to want to head into that camp and know who his starting 11 is. And while I think he knows mostly, like I think, for example, Johnson and Kone when fit will slot in. And for the most part, they're, the lineup set, there are still some debates like on the wings. What happens when it's Ahmed versus Buchanan? What happens between Schaffelberg versus Miller? Does Laren still keep a spot if he you know, doesn't find the net soon for Canada? Those are all debates to have. Heck, don't forget in goal, right? With Max Crepo yeah, versus no. Dane Sinclair. Because Dane Sinclair has been incredible lately for Minnesota. And he's knocking on the door. I think Marshma, you know, he's continuing to look and those battles will remain ever present. Although he, there, there's guys with inside tracks and I think it kind of reflects with the lineup you mentioned. Yeah, due, due to the fact that we're missing some players, it makes us a little bit easier. And the last window, having players like Schwanier and Ahmed put in the performances they did, I think just made this 11 pretty easy for me to put together. I think Kripo is the starting keeper. I think he's going to be our starting keeper for 2026. Although, you know, like you mentioned, Dane's right there. The real only debate, honestly, for me was Schaffelberger Miller, mainly because, you know, Schaff is just kind of coming back from a little time off because of uh, the birth of his his uh, child. And, you know, they, they basically, you'll see Miller start and then all of a sudden 60 minutes, Schaff's in or vice versa. The only other question, though, I do have, Alex, and I, I doubt it will happen, but do you think when Atakubi comes in, is there a chance that we could see maybe if Schaffelberger Miller start, one of them come off? Davies pushes up because we hasn't we haven't seen Davies play in a further position like that under Marsh, and then Adekubi goes in at left back. Or, or do you think there's a chance maybe we see it right from the start, which I don't really. No, I think that we, we do see a, a chance of Davies on the wing. I mean, it'll probably be contextual, right? We don't know what the game will look like at True. that point. Like, will, will Canada be up? Will they be trailing? What will they need? But you kind of do wonder if if, if Davies gets a look because ultimately, I don't think it was mind games when Jesse Marsh was saying like I like Alfonso Davies as a winger, I want to try him out there. It was ultimately circumstantial of Canada kind of had no other natural left backs. They put Davies there. He's shown. All right, good. Keep him there. But I do think there's a certain element of you You see what Davies can do when he goes higher up the pitch. You At the very least, it'll be a good ace up the sleeve maybe in a Nations League quarterfinal and you're down a goal. You, can, you know you can put Davies up there. So I have a feeling he'll try it out in some form, especially depending on the game state. I agree. And I like the fact that I know we only have one game this window and it's a friendly, but to me, it doesn't really feel like a friendly. I like that there's some stakes here on the line. Uh, so that's all for our preview today. I will say Alex and I had a couple of interviews. One just dropped with Santiago Lopez over in One Soccer, if you guys want to check it out, as well as Derek Cornelius, which was a, a really good interview. I really enjoyed chatting with him. It will be dropping. I'm not sure at the time of recording if it's not already out on one soccer it will be dropping soon but check out both of those interviews and alex's content as well on one soccer and on the northern football podcast and any other place that um he he's you know he, he's all over the place alex is but alex as always man i appreciate the time and hopefully we'll enjoy a pretty good game between canada and panama